Ruth Daniela, and thank you for having us today. Um, we, uh, it's an honor to speak today, and um, we hope you guys enjoy the talk that we're going to take you through. Um, we're going to take you through our seven-year journey into 3D. Um, it's hard to believe it's been that long, but we'll give you a, a little glimpse of kind of how we do our process, um, why 3D is important, challenges that we've um, faced throughout the journey and, and will face in the future, um, some must-haves that, that we've set to, to put a team in place. Um, we'll talk quite a bit about Gravity Sketch and why that's been such a, a great new tool for us. Um, Zach and Alexander are going to talk through um, a little how-to on how they're creating footwear. And then William's going to talk about the pipeline from Gravity Sketch to Moto. So just to take you a little through our journey, um, started back in 2015 and uh, we found a program called Moto and thought this was the way we we're going to get into 3D. We had the team come in and and teach us and they taught us how to create a salt shaker and we're like oh this is easy i can create a salt shaker and um seven years later we're still trying to perfect that that 3d vision um it's not so easy it takes time and it takes a lot of practice we use um four main tools right now at new balance so we use moto for modeling we're using colorway for um, color variation tech packs we use swatchbook for uh, digital materials and we're using Gravity Sketch now for concept modeling and um, idea generation. You know, when we look back and, and really talk about what the vision was, we really wanted to take the design team from being a 2D design organization to a 3D visual organization. And um, that meant training designers. Um, we wanted to be able to make better decisions using these 3D um, tools. And what we found during the journey was that um, 2D or 3D wasn't just for designers. It really became a tool for the entire organization. We went back and just, you know, think about old school versus new school. Um, you know, old school, we were sketching in a sketchbook, maybe doing a three quarter view. Most of the time we were doing a, you know, orthographic, typical lateral views, doing some, some uh, illustrator renderings. And then if we got crazy, we did a tape up on a last, and that was called 3D. Um, we've come a long way. You know, new school, most of the designers are, you know, on a tablet, on an iPad, um, sketching in various programs. We have a whole group of people who are now in Gravity Sketch modeling in 3D. And then we have designers and a whole 3D visualization team that are creating photo real assets um, in Moto. Moto is the tool of choice that, that we use. So quite a progression from uh, where a design or how a designer used to work to, to how they work now. Um, we really found that 3D visualization is a game changer. And we talk about, you know, why is there such a push to go to 3D? Um, there's a whole host of reasons, but a couple here that I wanna point out. Um, better decision making earlier in the process, that's a big one, right? For us, you know, we work on a 18 month calendar. If we can make better decisions earlier, we can get to what our final product's gonna be quicker. And that's a, that's a big advantage. Um, we are able to reduce the amount of samples that we make throughout the process um, because of the photo real assets that we're able to create. Uh, there's a huge cost savings for us in our factories um, when we make less prototypes. Um, there's also the ability to fast track product direct to the consumer. Um, we're, again, we're, if we're able to get to a final solution quicker, um, we can create that product quicker and get it to market faster. Um, so th those are some big, big call outs of why 3D is so important. The other thing with 3D is that when we create a single asset, um, it can be used throughout the organization. So our 3D journey starts with a designer creating something. Our 3D visualization team will make something that looks photo real. Everything that you're going to see in this presentation is a, is a 3D asset. There's no photographs. Um, you know, we use it to create tech packs. Um, we're creating, obviously, concept models. We've used it in replacement for photo shoots uh, when we don't have samples. We're using it on our website for content, either photography or, you know, added content like a video rotation or exploded view. Um, we're all using it in social media. So that one asset that you you create um, can be used multiple different ways, which is um, a pretty amazing use of, of uh, that asset. 
One of the biggest things that uh, we're still trying to instill is this digital first mindset. And, you know, what we want is that the digital tools will drive the creation process. Um, you know, when we started with 3D, we, we had a physical shoe and we tried to make a match, basically. Once we had that match, we could do color work, we could do material work. Um, but it wasn't helping us in designing the product. You know, flip that to where we are now. We're designing the product in 3D. We're, we're sharing that with the factory to say, this is what we want from, uh, this is what we want for our product. And we follow that path. So it's, it's a definitely a change in process. Um, that process change really happens um, based on your new tools. So if you try to take these new tools and put them into the same process that you've had before, you won't be successful. So you have to kind of take these new tools and look at what your process can be. COVID was um, a big deal, obviously, for all of us, but um, it really became, 3D became reality for us. Um, every company was affected differently. Um, when, th when it hit for New Balance, you know, we all were working from home. Um, many of our factories closed for long periods of time. But because we had a team of, um, of 3D artists and designers that could create in 3D, um, we were able to keep the process rolling. So we were able to have design reviews. We were able to have line reviews using 3D assets. Um, we were able to sell in product to retailers using 3D assets where we didn't have physical samples to be able to do that. So all the work that we did leading up to um, 2020 really came into play. And I think that has helped us kind of propel forward to continue to push the, the use of 3D tools. So I just want to talk a little bit about uh, virtual versus reality. Um, and these are estimations, but you know, for us to send a tech package to a factory in Asia, um, build the upper, the bottom unit, ship it back to the US, we're talking about 45 days. And that's to make a single sample or a pair of shoes. Um, if you want to do that in volume, there's a lot more time involved. Um, for us to create a virtual sample, so a photo real sample of something, we're talking about seven days, and that's a little bit of back and forth between an artist and a designer, but that's a huge time savings. And think about how many variations or how many iterations you can get of something um, if it only takes you that, you know, that short amount of time. So, you know, all this whole process, uh, it starts with design. And what we talk about a lot is how do we keep the designer in, in charge as long as possible? And, um, you know, with 3D, you can go from a hand sketch to a model to photo reel. And what we're trying to do is take the interpretation out for somebody else downstream. So in a two, typical 2D process, uh, we would hand off a tech pack to a factory and they have to interpret our 2D lines onto a 3D pattern. If we're able to now give a 3D file that they can rotate around 3D views or the actual 3D file itself, um, and then generate something that to generate a pattern to create 3D, um, there, we're that much closer to making something. And for, for us, the closer we can get, again, to the market and the quicker we can get to our final um, design in reality, uh, the better off we're going to be. So I talked a little bit about uh, visualization across the organization. And um, I look at it kind of in three different buckets. Um, product creation, which I've talked about, you know, visualizing, basically visualizing our concepts in 3D. We do a lot of color work. We do a lot of material work. Uh, we're able to do a lot of that utilizing our 3D assets. Uh, when you've kind of moved to the next phase, customer ready. So I talk about um, talking to our customers. So the, the, the stores that were selling our products so that they can turn around and sell it to the consumers. Um, we're able to give them added content. We're able to create um, really great stories, um, things that um, enhance the product to help us sell it into a retailer. And then that, the last phase, um, like I talked about consumer facing, um, you know, we're able to create these like exploded views, these great video animations, all done with our 3D visualization team, again, to help enhance the product, tell the story, maybe even tell the story of design of how that product came to be. We talk about um, two different types of models, and I think this is really important. Um, the difference between a concept model and a finished model. Um, 
our designers are building concept models. We don't want our designers spending the time to make something that's photo real, right? We want them to be able to do something kind of down and dirty, get their concepts out there, be able to share their concept with a marketing counterpart, a development team. Um, so it's a visual representative of the idea. It's not a finished model. Uh, we have a whole team of 3D artists who came from uh, video and animation, and their job is to create something that's photo real. Um, accuracy, super critical, the shape, the materials, all the details are super important um, to making a finished model. So we talked about the, the difference between concept model and finished model, um, the difference between designer and 3D artist, right? One of the things that we found is don't, you know, set the expectations for these different people. Um, again, I want a designer to use a 3D tool to allow them to express their ideas. I don't, I don't want them to get bogged down in, in all the details that it takes to make um, a 3D asset look perfect. And that's, you know, that's really what a 3D artist can do. Our 3D artists, um, we're not asking them to design, we're, actually, we're asking them to work with the design team and interpret and take that and create these photo real assets. Um, what's interesting is we're finding that these two spaces are starting to blend as, as more designers are starting to learn 3D. A big part of um, our success over the last seven years has been building an internal 3D team. Um, so like I said, we have a team in the U.S. that's um, headed by William, who you're going to hear from in a minute. Uh, they, you know, they're all amazing artists and can build anything. Um, we also partnered with our factories in Asia and, you know, we looked at it or they looked at it as taking their physical sample room and converting it into a digital asset room. And, you know, we're not doing this with everything. Obviously, we still need to make physical shoes, but for a good portion, we're able to make digital assets and um, getting that team on board has been huge. So we have a, you know, they complement our team in the U.S. You know, attention to detail and accuracy is something that we've talked about right from the start. For whatever reason, when somebody looks at an illustrator drawing, um, they know that it's fake. It doesn't matter if it's in proportion or a little bit off. You know, they, they look past that. When people look at a 3D asset, it has to be real. If it's off, people question it. They're like, well, that's not what it's going to really look like. So we go back and forth. So, you know, what we've pressed on our team is 100% accuracy with digital assets. So um, if you can tell left or right, um, left is the photograph, right is the digital asset, but still pretty hard to tell the difference there. Amazing work um, from our team. Materials is a big one. Um, you know, working remote plus, you know, working virtual, how do you touch and feel materials? Um, we teamed up with Swatchbook several years ago, and um, they've been a great partner for us. You know, they, um, they offer lots of different services for us. Um, we've, we, again, partnered with our vendors as well. Our vendors all work with Swatchbook, scan their materials each season, and supply materials to us uh, via Swatchbook. Um, so that's been great. The materials for us are able to flow directly into Moto and Colorway, so we're able to apply those materials with the data that comes with them um, included. So Swatchbook's been a great tool for us. You, know, you can't talk about footwear without talking about sustainability. And, um, you know, creating less samples cuts down on the use of materials. It's as simple as that. So if we make less um, prototypes and samples, we're, you know, less overall waste, less use of water, less use of energy to manufacture. We're shipping less shoes. Um, so, you know, sustainability is a huge push for us at New Balance. Um, so we're looking at how, how, you know, how digital assets can help us in, in that push. Scaling your capabilities is a big challenge as well. So it's easy to create one asset, um, find one great artist and you can create one. Um, try to create a whole range, it becomes really difficult. So, um, you know, for us, building a team of experts has been, been critical. I talked about the US team and then our team in Asia. Um, you know, training the designers to work in 3D is another big one. Um, you just have more 3D artists then. Having a consistent pipeline, William's going to talk a little bit about that, but um, needing that consistency so everybody's building the same way, their naming files the same way, 
um, that it just helps in, in creating that, those assets. And then um, building out asset libraries. You don't have to design everything or build everything in 3D every time you need it. Um, if you have an asset library, um, you know, you have your logos built, you have different components built, you can kind of mash things together um, to help speed up your process. You know, I talked a little bit earlier about challenges that we faced and the still challenges that we'll face in the future. Um, and you just heard it from the last speaker. Does it, like 3D is hard. And um, it's interesting how in the last two years, I feel mainly because of Gravity Sketch, a lot of designers are starting to, um, they're starting to get into it and, and, and enjoy it and really understand it. But um, that's a big one, just getting people on board with it. Um, people that have been doing 2D for years, uh, making that transi transition into 3D is a challenge. The second part for, you know, if you're trying to put 3D into an organization, um, explaining to a leadership team why you need 3D. Because um, a lot of people, maybe they don't understand why do we need that. It, the way we are doing things work, why would we need it? Um, something that I've done is I've always had a, like a two-year plan on where we wanted 3D to go. You know, how are we going to use 3D? How is it going to save us money? How is it going to save us time? You know, so if you can explain that to your leadership group, um, you can get budget for your team, for your tools, for your software. Um, again, we've been doing this for seven years. Um, we have a pretty good sized team. People understand the benefit to 3D. Um, so that's a big, big, big deal. Partnering with the software companies is another one. Um, you know, we have partnered with the Foundry. We've partnered with Gravity Sketch over the past couple of years. And um, it's so important because you want your part, the software company to know where you're trying to take the program and how it's going to help your company. And I know that Gravity Sketch wants to know what we want in the program. And they've been great where they, you know, they're showing us new tools. They're asking us what we want, implementing those things on the fly. And um, when you have that partnership, it just, uh, it just wants more, more people want to get into the program and use it because there's such that active collaboration. You know, think about opportunities as we look ahead. Um, we, a lot of, we talk about the metaverse and what does that mean, but what it means is this whole kind of new age of digital designers and a need for more and more 3D. And, um, you know, the more, th more designers that can learn 3D, the better. Um, there's going to be more consumer experiences through 3D. Um, you know, I know that we're looking at different ways to visualize footwear and apparel on consumers before they buy anything. Uh, so that's, that's super important. Um, designers and 3D artists becoming one, you know, young designers that are coming into the industry now, they all know how to use Keyshot and Blender and Gravity Sketch. And they know how to use everything, right? So they're almost, they're, they're becoming a 3D artist and a designer all in one. And um, it's just a new age of designers uh, that we're seeing come through um, and be part of our brand. So I'm going to um, I'm going to pass it on to to my teammates now. So um, Zach and Alexander are going to take you through um, a little demo of Gravity Sketch and how they're using it um, in our in in the real world. So this is not I'd like I'd like to use it. They're using it every day for their job in designing shoes. So um, Zach, Alexander, I'll let you guys take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Jared. So, so yeah, New Balance has, has really made a big initiative to adopt the new 3D tools like Gravity Sketch and integrate them into our design pipeline. And, and it's been really great working closely with you all at Gravity Sketch to, to really help us make that happen. Um, and the two big reasons that we've distilled about why we really love using Gravity Sketch are because it helps you unlock creativity because of its very intuitive UI. Um, it's really, it feels natural to navigate in this, in the 3d space. And the second big reason is the collaboration aspect. So we feel that it really improves communication and, and productivity among team members, and it could totally revolutionize like ideation and sketch sessions or design reviews. I think you're muted, Zach. Sorry. 
I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so where a lot of 3D programs tend to be kind of be overwhelming initially, uh, a lot of large complicated interface, even a, a, like the viewport gets narrower and harder to view. Um, we really appreciate how distilled the tool set is on Gravity Sketch and just found it easier to pick up and learn. Um, the immersive 3D space is kind of just honestly more fun to uh, to work in as well. It's like that <laughs> you guys hear my dogs sneezing back here. I apologize. Um, <laughs> that's, that's Ridge that we were talking about earlier. Uh, so again, uh, I, I think what we wanted to talk about was basically how Gravity Sketch just felt easier to pick up. Everything's distilled, every tool models, uh, um, pardon me, every tool matters and it's just overall less daunting and it feels more creative. So uh, where, where we're saying the interface is kind of crowds the space, Gravity Sketch, it disappears if you're not using it. And it just kind of lets you focus on the model at hand and kind of digest what you're building. Um, the next slide, please. So back to the collaboration aspect, um, it, it really changes the game because it remotely allows you to improve your the communication of your design intent, not only to coworkers, but also to the factories. And when we share out these designs with our marketing team, it's a lot easier to determine that design intent with something 3D versus just like 2D orthographic uh, views. And so that way we're collectively all making more informed decisions. Yeah, so a little context about the project we're about to walk you through is that uh, a lot of Alexander and I's work hasn't been released. So we took this opportunity to kind of uh, basically collaborate and elevate this relatively simple model I had previously built. Uh, it's worth noting that, you know, we were able to work remotely. Alexander's down in Mexico, I'm up in Oregon, and we're able to sit in the same digital space and kind of adjust and discuss edits in real time. Uh, and then Alexander is kind of about to walk you through the setup and the basic premise of this, this model where we take basically a couple inspiration images and see how we could apply them to evolve this basic model. Yeah, so, so like Zach was, was saying, the, the first part is really setting up the space. And usually our projects start with a brief and then like gathering any research or inspiration. Um, or any 2D or 3D, 3D sketches and really personalizing and customizing your, your interactive space. And the next step, which is a really important one, is, is gathering all of your 2D and 3D assets that you could use as references. Uh, thanks to William and the 3D team, uh, we have a vast library of 3D resources. And so some things we like to, to put into our space are lasts that we use or any reference models or scans that I'll, that I'll talk more about later. And also predecessor like tech packs that, that have dimensions. Yeah, so when you get the setup, you have your last and references, what we find really cool and sort of liberating is the, the hands-on nature of working with sub D in JS. Uh, we like the modeling, pro it's kind of like working with clay. Um, we liken it to you're able to like push and pull surfaces. And as you see it in the 3D space, you kind of get a sense of the volume. So there's a lot of parallels to say a clay modeler in the automotive industry. And so from a simple block of clay in the beginning, you can really take this to really sophisticated surfaces and details. And it's sort of up to you how far you push and pull uh, to get to these really professional level builds, to be honest. Uh, to expand on that, Alexander will touch on how we target accurate builds on the next slide. So the, the goal of, of what you're seeing on the left here is really massaging the midsole to, to match specific dimensions on a tech pack. And this is a really crucial step uh, for where you bridge from concept to reality. And on the right, uh, you're, you're looking at a, a scan that we used as an underlay to, to rough in proportions and dimensions similar to what we were, we were going for. So that's another approach that you can build and snap surfaces directly to the scan. And that'll, that'll serve as a great starting point. And it's, this is all important because early on in the process, you want to get your, your net widths and stack heights as close as possible so that you could hand off 
hand this off to engineers to get the shoe really production ready. <clears throat> yeah, so back to our initial concept, what you're seeing on the screen is where Alexander and I worked within the Gravity Sketch workspace. Uh, this is really fun to look at our suspended chair kind of inspiration images and bounce these ideas back and forth in real time. Uh, it's, it's fun to work in gesture and big blocks early. Like I like to start in thumbnails when I sketch on paper and GS Gravity Sketch basically allows you to work in these big gestural movements with your hands in 3D space. And that's something I, I couldn't do in other 3D programs. So that, that really kind of liberated a lot of early exploration and kind of finding big blocks and early gestures. Um, I think because of the joint nature of this, like the being able to collaborate in 3D space, kind of ended up in places that I personally wouldn't have ended up on just my own. Um, so this was a fun project to kind of take our production hat off for a second and just kind of look at these really super far out conceptual suspended heels and how could we build that. Um, the next few slides, Alexander will walk you through a few tools that we basically use the vast majority of the time. Yeah, so so yeah, we started with the 2D, 2D sketch and you can see on the left that there was a loose idea of the, of the heel component but it was when we got into that collaborative space that that we were able to look at our inspiration imagery and and ideate on multiple different builds in 3D within a very short period of time. And this is when we we evolved the concept a bit further and realized that it could be really cool to connect the the heel component to the plate to create something new and and forward. So moving Moving on uh, to the upper, uh, a very quick and accurate way to build an upper is to use a scan, like I mentioned earlier, and a, especially a scan that uses the same last that you're intending to use. And you could just uh, use the snap to surface feature when sub demodeling. And on the left, you could see before and after, like the difference of sometimes when you get scans, whether, whether you take a phone scan using apps like Polycam or, or a factory scan, the mesh is, is usually really dense and unusable. And once you, you re-topologize the, the surface, you could then use that uh, mesh and, and manipulate it. So using the same tool as, as the prior page, uh, you could use the sub-D snap feature to, to build the upper overlays. Um, so it's, again, really intuitive. Um, and free-flowing UI. And a lot of the time in Gravity Sketch is spent really noodling and, and massaging until you, you get the final result that you want. And you could just kind of rinse and repeat for, for all of your other overlays. And in the case where you're building a new component, like a tongue, um, again, alluding to the power of, of sub-D modeling, you could really quickly and easily create these new components. Um, and it really does illustrate the power of, of sub D. So lastly, to get your model to a, a more finished place to, to finish up some details like the laces um, and webbings or eyelets, eye rows, or, or even stitches, um, you could use the stroke tool. And there's a lot of uh, really handy built-in features where you could twist and turn the geometry. And it's a really short learning curve to, to do this versus some other 3D programs. Yeah, so this is uh, this is basically how far we we can take it sometimes. Um, and after final design approval with say the full triad, so your marketing teams and aligned design leadership, of course costing, uh, this is where we would hand the model off. And there's kind of a dual path at this point. Um, one path is we hand off to our engineers and factory to sort start working through development. Uh, and then the other path is for our 3D visualization team. Uh, Gravity Sketch has some great uh, export features and the models even export extremely light that uh, I know William here will, will touch on. So this is a good point to hand off to our, our moto guru, William, and his uh, 3D visualization kind of expertise.
So he's muted too, but can you guys hear William or is it just me? No, no. I can't. Okay. Yeah, he's not, I don't know, I haven't been having luck with the video. You, um, it doesn't show that he's muted. Try changing. You know, I, um, I can't see Will because I, I, my, I'm in presentation mode. Is he on screen? Oh. <laughs> he he's was, not. but now he's got, sorry, Daniel. Oh, no, I was just going to say that he was on screen and his camera wasn't working. Now your mic is not working. Maybe if you do the same thing as you did before, well, we might fix things up. We might lose him for a little bit, but then he'll come back. Yeah, if not, we can we can take you through this. So why don't we um, why don't we keep moving? Um, I'll I'll try to present this stack, Alexander. You can add in as well. Um, and if will, if will you jump on? Um, I'll let you take it over. Um, William and his team have have worked with the team from Gravity Sketch to create um, a workflow, basically. And um, you know, for us, we want that asset that starts as two D art to go to a three um, D artist and then to the factory. And um, it's important that the asset can flow from one to the next. And what has been great about Gravity Sketch is that we're able to um, export the file and able to bring it into a program like Moto, add color, material, texture. Um, we can bring it back to Gravity Sketch if we need to make modifications. So that ability to go back and forth is, um, is really a big deal for us. You know, another thing that we talk about is um, is language and when designers start to understand 3d they start to speak the same language as the 3d artists do so they can talk about polygons and n-gons and all these different things um, because they're working in the same way you know in the past when designers were only in 2d they didn't understand uh, all that language so that's a big thing to to have them speaking the same language you know within moto um, we I talked about this a little bit. The, the file comes into Moto and it's pretty malleable. Um, you know, Zach talked about it comes in kind of lightweight. So we're able to, within Moto, um, we're able to to do we're to continue to do modeling within that program. Um, you know, I've heard Keyshot and some other things. Um, all those programs work. We we picked up Moto um, ways back, so that's that's what we're teaching our team. Um, again, you can take it from here push it back to Gravity Sketch um, and, and do, you know, they go back and forth seamlessly. Um, UV mapping is important as well. And um, I wish I could say I knew how to do it, but I do know what it's for. Um, you know, we want to UV our, our uppers so that we can put accurate materials um, and textures on the uppers. So, um, you know, we'll create UVs for uh, the key parts within Moto so that we can take it from you know, a base model to that photo real model. You know, within Moto, um, we have color presets. We have our material presets that come in directly from Swatchbook. So we're able to drag and drop um, materials onto that Gravity Sketch model within Moto to, to bring a little bit more life to it. Um, what you guys are seeing here is, is very basic, um, but this is something that we created just for this presentation. I think you see from the assets that we showed earlier of how photo real we can make this. Um, lighting and scene setup, again, um, you can do it in various programs. Um, we're able to set our lights. Um, we have specific studio setups. Um, we try to match our web settings. So the assets that you see on our website, um, we have scenes set up within Moto that match those. So that when we create an asset, if we want to use it downstream for, um, for the website, the assets are already created. Um, so that's a that's big advantage. Like we talked about how these assets move from product creation into um, consumer facing. 
we're also able to do animations with these gravity sketch assets. Um, so um, a lot of times when we want to tell the story of a product, we want to show uh, an exploded view or we want to do a specific rotation or show how the product's going to flex. So again, we're able to take that same gravity sketch model um, and animate it within Modo. So, you know, just a couple advantages just to wrap up here. Flexibility to go back and forth from gravity sketch to Modo. Um, there's no, the, no interpretation, right? So a, a 3D artist gets a file from a designer and they're just adding to it. They're not starting from scratch. Uh, they're building on top of it. And then um, as Alexander talked about, there's a lot of Moto presets. So there's a whole host of, of uh, parts and pieces that we've built already that somebody within Gravity Sketch can pull out and start to use as they're building their model. And it helps to bring in that um, sense of reality uh, that much more when you have the, those assets at your hands. So I'm going to end there. Uh, um, Daniela, say to you about how we brought our, or how we're bringing 3D to a reality at New Balance. Um, like we said, it's been uh, seven years and we, we're continuing to learn every day. All of our designers are training daily, weekly on this. And um, we look at it as an advantage. And, uh, you know, thank you again for having us be part of this. So I'm going to. I'm going to shut my screen. Thank you so much. Um, William's going to be upset that he didn't get to talk. Yeah. Can you guys hear me now? You can. Yes. We can hear now. This was this was my 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 sneaky way of, of making Jared have to talk more about 3D. <laughs> I I re I, all I did was refresh the the browser and all of a sudden it's working now. But Jared killed it. So there you go. <laughs> well, we still have some questions, so you might be able to answer some of those. I'm happy um, to answer any questions. All right. So we also have a guest speaker jumping in in a bit, but I first want to go through a few questions. Um, all right. So let's have some from the audience, and then I'll I'll say some from from my side. Um, do you visualize in Modo or some other package? B Red, B Ray, Unreal. So our main 3D program is Moto. That's the majority of our pipeline. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I was going to mention, uh, which kind of ties into this, is the the assets that um, that Alexander and Zach and the other designers create in Gravity Sketch come in so clean. We have the multiple options, right? We have the the render. We can export a render mesh, or we can export the control cage, um, and uh, and so there's little to no cleanup needed. And if we need to or would like to do additional edits, um, it's really easy to work with those meshes in Moto. So the the, the um, gravity sketches, you know, and, and the tools that we use in our, our pipeline, they complement each other and they play nice together, which which can't be said about all all software. Nice. Thanks. And have you found this workflow with Gravity Sketch simplifies or eliminates designers' needs for traditional 2D blueprint drawings? I would say not yet, but that's that's where we're trying to get to, right? So we talk about our 3D model should become our tech pack. And um, once you're in 3D, there's really no reason to go back to 2D. So that's that's where we're trying to get to. Um, with all of this. We do have several designers that are working, you know, they're fully capable in, in Gravity Sketch or in, in Moto, and they're using their, their models as tech packs. And, and it's, we're seeing a huge advantage with that. That's a, that's a crazy, a crazy shift. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when that will be, uh, you know, really beneficial for designers not having to do tech packs anymore. Yeah. Um, how do you motivate the rest of your team to get into working this way? We find that many designers are a little hesitant to get into 3D because of the negative experiences they have had with it in the past. Yeah, um, that's a big challenge. And, and, you know, I think it's almost like you can't push people or a team to do it until they're ready. And um, we, like I said, we've been doing this seven years and, Will can attest to it. The first couple of years, it was tough. Um, 
I don't think we were ready. I don't think, I don't know if the tools were ready, but, um, you know, now I, I, I know our team is ready for sure. Um, Will holds like a, a Friday um, training session in moto. Um, we do gravity sketch training constantly. I think what's been great is that we're starting to see success with people. So Zach and Alexander are using gravity sketch. They're presenting at design reviews, you know, their models. And I think it's just pushing other designers to be like, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to show my concept that way. And, um, these guys are teaching classes to the rest of the design team. And when you hear it from another designer to say, this is how I'm doing it, um, it goes a long way. So, you know, I, I again, I, I think I heard it earlier today in a presentation. Um, it feels like the tools are there and, and we're ready for it. And people are really starting to, to get on board. Any tips for using these assets to help communicate with production partners overseas? Um, yeah. Zach, you want to take it? Uh, well, or Louis, I see is bouncing around the chat board too. He's kind of a resident expert on that, but that's kind of uh, early stages, I would say. And we're, we're working through that in the last few seasons. So it's getting close to being a reality, but it's, we're kind of finding our way with that right now. Um, they tend to work in NURBS and Rhino and things like that. So the translation has been something that we're trying to get them over to more sub D kind of models to work back and forth. So during revisions, we're going to expedite that kind of process as well, which I know Alexander and I are looking forward to. So that's coming, I think. It's not fleshed out yet. Yeah, we talked about that, or I talked about that digital first mindset. And it's not just um, like the U.S. teams, we're looking for, you know, we have moto teams or 3D teams, I'll say, in all of our factories. And they're like in this little room, air conditioned room that's a factory. Um, we need them integrated with the developers. So when they get a tech pack and they break down a product, um, we want them to do that with a 3D asset and be able to spin it around, look at it, come back to us and say, hey, we can't build it this way. And, and then we modify that until we get something that is 100% what we want and 100% manufacturable, and then they can go build it. Yeah, it's, it's all about like getting everyone to speak the same language in a way, right? Like by getting everyone to, to work in 3D, because right now everyone is working in different languages in a way. Yep, yep. Sometimes real languages. But <laughs> um, and you, you mentioned something really that, that I really like how you separated um you mentioned concept models versus fi final and like perfect models it's something that it's really hard for people to start like to kind of like understand because for a really long time 3d has been seen as this final thing that you you only see at the final stages also because it was so hard to do right like so hard to achieve that you would just leave it until the very end so now you're seeing these concept models these these ways of representing these three-dimensional ideas in a quick way, but how do you how do you keep that balance? Because if you show something that it's 3D, it's automatically going to get, and you mentioned this, Jared, like if you show something 3D, people are going to automatically think that this is kind of like the finished thing. And so you need to make sure that you're showing something that it's perfect, right? But if you're showing something that is perfect, maybe you're spending too much time on perfecting it before actually just developing some of the ideas only that they're in 3D. So how do you balance all of that? Yeah, I think, um, I think for a lot of designers, they just, there's, there's, they just can't be like afraid to use the tool. And um, what I've been really happy to see is that a lot of designers are just getting in there and, and roughing out shapes. Um, you know, think about if you do orthographic views, your heel doesn't match the side, it doesn't match the top. But if you do a very basic drawing, you can show what that toe looks like or that heel and how everything kind of comes together. Um, so, you know, it's kind of baby steps. And, you know, yeah, it might, I think for like these two guys that are here, it doesn't take them that long to create something that looks pretty realistic, right? So it's just that learning curve where you have to get up to speed. You get to a point where you can create something um, pretty dramatic. Um, and then it's that, you know, that last 20% that you could spend days on that they don't need to do it because they they're they're roughing out their ideas um so but again a rough 3d is still better than 2d right it's still more representation it gives you a better representation of what it's going to be 
and it's also less back and forth when the you know when a designer is working with a 3D production artist to do the final 3D visualization, we find that it's a lot less back and forth. And have you found yourself kind of like collaborating real time to make the changes more and more now that you're working in 3D? Yeah, it, it's much easier. Instead of doing a lot of um, redlining uh, and drawovers, uh, we can just hop on a call and, um, and make the changes in real time. Nice. All right, I'm gonna welcome, there's also some few more questions on the chat, but I do want to welcome Joseph Trojan um, to the stage. So he's gonna probably have a lot of questions. He's joining us. He's going to be another speaker um, during the week. He's coming from Puma. So Joseph, hello. welcome. Hello, hello. Great to meet you all online. Nice like hey, Joseph. This is what I call a packed presentation. So much information. I'm uh, overwhelmed. There's notes all over the place. And of course, I have lots of questions. I mean, we are the same industry tackling pretty similar challenges. It's exciting to see, uh, to hear and see how far you guys are already. Uh, I would like, especially like to focus at the, at the blurring of the lines. I think Daniela kind of touched upon uh, with the last question. But like you guys are saying, designers basically using Gravity Sketch, making the, at the simple models, then it goes into the model. Zach, Alexander, is this really true? Are you guys only using Gravity Sketch? It, it, isn't the portfolio somehow growing? How are you uh, like dealing with the Instagram posts and uh, people posting uh, their renders from Blender? I don't know. Uh, we had the... A talk from Juma uh, recent, uh, just before when he goes into the sculpting tools. Are you sticking just to gravity sketch? Yeah, it's a great, a great question. Um, yeah, I think largely a lot of the base forms uh, that that I do, I use gravity sketch, and I'm able to create a lot of different, um, a lot of different like complex components with gravity sketch coupled with rendering programs as well. And I think I use a lot of rendering programs to generate textures um, for like the Instagram, et cetera. But I think, you know, being well versed in like computational design uh, or more parametric design would really take you to that next level uh, using softwares like Grasshopper. But per personally, I don't delve too much into that. I spend more time um, like really problem solving and, and figuring out, you know, how I can tell the story. So most of my time, I'm not necessarily spending on the modeling aspect, uh, but making sure that the concept that I'm creating is is compelling. If that answers your question. 100%. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, maybe on top of this, you guys mentioned that you put into the Gravity Sketch very often um, 3D scans uh, to get the proportions as precise as possible. Do you also work from like a, a models made prior or uh, do you have some kind of an archive so let's say i have the shoe already modeled from last season it's kind of a low poly i can put it into gravity sketch and start building off out of that yeah so um i'm a big fan of references getting in there especially early on so uh like the 3d visualization team will build out full tilt models beforehand uh and so prior season if there's a model with similar stack heights or, or things like that well they'll share those out and i think even further they have they've done an amazing job of having all the assets like we have all our proprietary lasts already modeled out by them and they're super lightweight and easy to work with uh they have relaxed lasts everything like that so the other unlock for me personally was um, Alexander stumbled onto Polycam, I think. And so mm -hmm. the photogrammetry was really cool. We, that's kind of a new thing for us as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we, we're big on using underlay references, so to speak. Sounds good. Um, Maybe one more question to William. I have to go ask for it. Go for it, Joseph. <laughs> All I know about Modo comes from your tutorials. Uh, so um, I'm a big fan. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, how did it happen that, like, from the characters, you uh, are in the footwear for such a long time uh, already? 
It's it's actually a good question. Um, it's something that, that definitely wasn't planned. Uh, I met Jared uh, a little over seven years ago, and um, he you know was looking to bring 3D to to New Balance, and uh, and I've always been in education. Uh, you know, beyond the, you know, the videos that I, I do online, um, I, I've taught since the 90s. And um, when I when I met Jared, uh, uh, I, I, I believed I, I knew that he would need somebody to go in and help him set not not just train the designers, but set up a, you know, set up a production pipeline and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and we started talking and it first started off as uh, just consulting. But um, I fell in love with the company. I mean, New Balance is an amazing company. And, uh, and you know, the fact that they were an early adopter of 3D is, is pretty exciting. And whether you're making characters or spaceships or, you know, uh, or game assets, um, for me, it's all about creating and, and you know, building the 3D assets. So uh, I, I, I tell a lot of people, if you can model an accurate shoe, you can model anything because there's a lot of stuff going on on those shoes. <laughs> It's a great quote. I would, I will use it. I'll use it tomorrow right away. <laughs> Thank you. I have much more questions, but I guess Daniela, you also want to ask some. Well, I have some from the audience, so I'll ask a couple, Joseph, and then we can jump back <laughs> to yours. Um, let me, um, Alex and Zach, do you consider yourselves designers, three D artists? Um, what are your thoughts on the blend between the two? Uh, interesting. <laughs> I've never been asked that direct. I would say, I mean, I, I went to school for design. I have a big a passion for design. So I, I guess design for myself. Um, I'm very, I like to approach design from a problem solving perspective. And that's, that's kind of my, my personal focus. So curious, Alexander, where you, where you land with that? Yeah, I definitely, I, we're, we're pretty similar. I think I land closer to the design designer side of things but i think 3d has just allowed me to express my ideas much more clearly and kind of repeating what i was i was saying before i, I do spend more time in the problem solving um and and kind of research phases and yeah i like to think through my idea my ideas and then you know use 3d quickly to try and express my uh concepts but i think moving forward it'll be interesting to see you know, if the designer really does become the 3D designer, um, I think I think that's a tall task. But uh, you know, I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if it if it did happen. But right now is a really interesting time between between the combination of those two uh, skill sets. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jared I, mentioned I, this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jared. Just, no, I, I was I, just going to say that you mentioned that like younger generation of designers are now coming out like this, right? More more of a combined thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Alexander is a great example. He, he's, he's got a bunch of tools that he knows how to use um, to create what he wants to create. Um, you know, I always, I, I think the skill sets are going to come closer together, but I still think there's a need for designers and, and visual artists, right? The, our need for um, creating visual scenes, whether it's for the metaverse or it's for a social media post, um, that's what the 3D team will become rather than building the individual asset. So um, everybody's job is going to kind of evolve as we start to use these tools more and more. Do you find your designers getting too tight too fast? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I think Gravity Sketch allows you to be really loose and, and free. Um, and I think that's why so many uh, designers are, are gravitating towards it. Um, I think more, you know, with the previous, you know, Moto or other programs, I think they had to have a concept pretty tight before they went into that program um, to because it, it's harder to visualize. Um, so, yeah, I think Gravity Sketch gives you that freedom to continue to sketch in 3D, basically. Um, so it, it can stay loose. Would you agree that working in 3D is not only design, uh, design initiative slash tool, but there is a bridge of opportunity to push forward 3D in the development lens and not, not be perversive as process and not end result? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do. Yeah. I, I think, um, yeah, 3D goes beyond design. 
and um, you know that's that digital first mindset, right? So if if we all look at that digital asset and say um, scrutinize it just as much as we would as a as a physical prototype, um, you know, for construction, can we can we get costing based on a three D design? We look at color and materials on it. If you can do all those things virtually. Um, again, you can get to what your final solution is that much faster. So yeah, I, I think everybody who touches product needs to get involved with the 3D process. Are you, are you doing 3D printing in the process? Because you mentioned a lot of like digital first, but are you like still doing physical stuff? Yeah, we do. We, um, we, we 3D print our sole units. Um, we look at them. Um, you know, we don't typically print uppers, but, um, sole units, but, you know, well, I think what's interesting about the collaboration part that, um, you guys talked about in your keynote was, is that, um, because we're working remote, we have people all over the country. We can, we can be in a 3d space and kind of mark something up and, and have that same sort of meeting that you would have when you have a printed part in an office. So that that's really to me, that's super exciting. That that's where like this next phase to me is going to go. Yeah, and it's really all about communication. I mean, everything that you have been speaking about is is about communication, right, with the other yeah. the other team members. Joseph, do you have any last questions? Last questions. I have this uh, the question about the in like the challenges. Uh, I think Jared has mentioned. Uh, this transition from the, let's say there is a 2D designer and now he uh, or she needs to start working in the early sketch. Are you like facing any pushbacks? Are there designers who just don't want to go into gravity sketch and uh, how do you guys deal with this? Or are you like embracing it? Uh, is it like a, a, a stream of work uh, next to the 3D or is everybody in New Balance now? working in 3d you know it's um each individual is different and like i said you have to be ready for it and then you have to dedicate yourself to to learning the program so we have all different ranges we have these guys who can model anything right and we have other people who are just taking a midsole and and sculpting it and that's a good step for them right we you know we we try to tell people like take a 90 day period and just learn one thing, you know, learn how to sculpt, learn how to, I don't know, you know, draw your up or just learn one aspect of it. Cause if you think about the whole thing, like how am I going to model this whole shoe? I, I can never do what William does. But if you think, you know, this season I'm going to do step one, next season I'm going to do step two. And then all of a sudden it like clicks in and, and people fast forward. I, we've in the last year seen a huge progression in, inability of people. And um, I just think it's the um, people are inspired by others around them and they talk and help each other. And then all of a sudden it's just, it's a wave and, and everybody's starting to do it. So huge, huge variation of, of talent or not talent, but um, ability within our team. Um, but um, yeah, I think everybody's getting on board and uh, you know, that's all we can ask. I just wanted to, to add to that um, something that that I've seen that has worked uh, for some of the designers at New Balance, and it's the advice that I would give any anybody that is wanting to introduce 3D into their workflow is that don't look at it as uh, something that is replacing your skill set or replacing the tools you already use. Just look at it as another tool that you're adding and don't feel like you have to create that finished shoe right away. Use 3D for one, like introduce it into one aspect of your workflow. It could be something as simple as taking an existing last or base form, uh, like we have an asset library full of, of these, um, you know, these models, and just projecting uh, your graphics on it and seeing how it falls over the 3D shape. And, and that might be the only uh, thing that you use 3D for in the beginning is to just get an idea of how is this, you know, uh, how are these graphical elements going to wrap on a 3D mesh? And if, if that's all you do and it helps you, then introduce another aspect. And then before you know it, 
you're building a, you know, you could be building a full shoe, or maybe you find that all you really need it for is, you know, a, a, a few areas of the design process. And eventually you're animating the flexing also. Yep. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the info. And yeah, I think, I mean, I had a, a, a question that was kind of like almost piggybacking on that, but it's more of a comment that, yeah, sometimes it's a bit daunting to go into 3D, especially because, you know, sometimes when you're trying to express an idea, if you're using a pen and a paper, you don't really need to think about any technicalities. But when you start going into 3D, you start to learn a lot of these terminologies that seem to be very difficult to learn or remember or even understand what they are because it's so much. So like taking those steps little by little, it, it is helpful. But yeah, it's still daunting. I won't I won't lie, right? We still need to learn to learn a lot of technical terms and and be okay with it.